Hey, folks, it is that time again. It's time for another episode of Getting to Know Dinah Trace. And, and this, this week's episode, this week's episode is actually the crossover event that you didn't know that you needed. And this, this week, we're actually doing a crossover with one of our other Dynatrace uh, webinars, which is an ongoing uh, event, which is the principal's office. So this is the crossover. This is it. Our first ever Dynatrace crossover series where getting to know Dynatrace meets the principal's office. So because this is getting to know Dynatrace, and it's actually been a while since we've had an opportunity to chat with everyone. It has been, uh, we missed the last one. We had to take a, had to take a moment out because, uh, you know, folks were busy and traveling and stuff like that. We got a lot to talk about, a lot to catch up with. So let's get things started. As with every Getting to Know Dynatrace episode, what makes them special is your participation. So as we get into the demonstration portion of today's conversation, please, Ask us questions, whatever medium that you're using. If you're watching us on LinkedIn, if you're watching us on Twitch, if you're using Facebook, if it's Reddit, whatever it might be, feel free to ask questions in that local whatever stream you're watching us on, and we'll do our best to respond to those streams. And I can see that we've got people coming in from all over the world. We've got folks from Columbus, from Switzerland, from Hungary, from London. It's an international audience. That's great. So let's get into let's get into things. Let's start things off with, and I, hopefully everyone can see my screen here, and it's uh, looking the way that we uh, are expecting it to. Let's get things started with the first segment of getting to know Dynatrace, which is always what's new. So if you're new to Dynatrace, and this is the first getting to know Dynatrace session that you've ever joined or ever participated in, where do you go to find out what's new at Dynatrace? Well, it's real easy. You go to the Dynatrace blog. So dynatrace.com slash blog slash news is going to get you there to the same sort of set of resources, and you're going to find out everything that's new at Dynatrace. Now, since the last time we talked, a lot of things have been happening uh, with Dynatrace. Specifically, a lot of new capabilities have rolled out recently. So there is everything from the new uh, Grail Data Lakehouse that is being used to allow you to ingest logs, to ingest business events. There is the new uh, automation engine. There's the new app engine. There are all sorts of new things. And we're going to take some time today in this very special edition of Getting to Know Dynatrace. We're going to talk about a lot of the new stuff. We'll go back and make sure that we cover, you know, some of the stuff that uh, if you're new to Dynatrace is, uh, you know, the core things that you need to know but we also want to show you a bunch of the new stuff as well. But remember, always go to that blog. I'm going to flip over to the blog right now real quick here. And let's walk through uh, some of the articles that, you know, you should, you know, definitely dive into. There are, you can see here with the blog site, we're spending a lot of time and attention on very industry specific uh, blog articles. Things like, for example, um, you know, Dynatrace and how it applies and allows people to uh, help restore trust uh, or restore public trust in government agencies. That's a fabulous article about how Dynatrace is helping out in the public sector. There's all sorts of other articles like here you can see, you know, this is kind of, you know, uh, how uh, we've got a podcast that's talking about how we can help enable secure cloud migration across the U.S. Coast Guard's IT systems. And then you can see here, there's other articles in terms of, you know, how to easily build extensible automation from SaaS to the edge. And we can go through this. You can see article after article, of just fabulous, valuable information that, you know, I draw your attention to. Here's a great one that Wolfgang Beer, uh, I've, I've done some seminars with uh, Wolfgang in the past at our Perform Conference. Wolfgang is just such a great guy. And uh, here he's actually showing us how, to basically use Dynatrace to monitor an open AI-based chat GPT uh, type uh, application. And, and it's funny, when you go in underneath the hood of all of this chat GPT stuff, all of these large language models and open AI, you know what's underneath the hood driving a lot of this, like mechanically, the actual software that's being used? It's very much Kubernetes-based. 
So if you're using, if you're familiar with containers, if you're familiar with OpenShift, Kubernetes, all of that stuff, you're going to look at it and you're going to say, oh, I know exactly how these things are now working together. So, you know, it's a super, super interesting blog article. Really take your time, give that a read. It's very enlightening because, you know, we think of a lot of this conversation around open AI and chat GPT. It just, it sounds like it's a great big black box, but you know what? It's software. It runs on something. And Wolfgang actually walks us through how Dynatrace can be used to help monitor those types of applications. So that's a little bit about the what's new, walking through the blog. If you're new to Dynatrace, this is where I would tell you to go to find out you know, some really interesting applications of how Dynatrace is helping out organizations and just how Dynatrace works with you know, specific technologies. So let's get back into our program here and let's get to the next segment, which is, did you know? Okay, so did you know this one? I'm going to go out on a limb because this is kind of a trick. It's taking did you know to a little bit of a place where, you know what, most people probably didn't know this one because it's so new. It is new. I'm not being fair, but let's talk, talk about it. Did you know that we have a completely new and updated design system called Strato. So if you are playing with any of the new capabilities of Dynatrace, any of the new Grail, the notebooks feature, the app engine, the automation engine, uh, some of the new dashboarding capabilities, all of that is being driven by an entirely new design system. So what does that mean for you? It means that things may look a little bit different than what you may have been used to in the past with Dynatrace. This new design system, we, the reason that we came up with it was because we are allowing the platform to become more extensible. And we wanted to do this in a very thoughtful by design fashion. And so we've created a new design system that as people are building out applications on top of Dynatrace, they can take advantage of the exact same design system that we use when we're building out capabilities. You'll notice that it's an entirely new look and feel. It's got some things that are common that are similar to the way that we worked with Dynatrace in the past. If you go and look on the left-hand side, there's a left-hand nav, and you can navigate through different items in that left nav. However, what you'll notice is the big change are the fact that all of the pieces and screens in the past, uh, the, what you've seen in Dynatrace, they are now considered to be apps or applications within Dynatrace. So what that means is when you drop into the new design system, you'll see a lot more icon-driven approaches to navigating around Dynatrace. So that is going to be familiar to just about everybody because if you know how to work one of these things, uh, if you know how to work a tablet, you'll know how to navigate around inside of Dynatrace. You're just going to be looking for specific apps. It, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's super intuitive. It's going to make it a lot easier for people to just naturally be able to work with Dynatrace because it works the exact same way as your phone or your tablet does. You navigate around by clicking the app that you want. And because we have this new app engine in the future, we expect there to be more and more apps added by way of the Dynatrace hub that you can add to your instance of Dynatrace as well. So that's a little bit about that design system. It's there for a purpose. And that purpose is just make it easier for you to navigate around and make sure that everything has the same consistent look and feel. So that's enough about this did you know. Let's get to the real reason that we're here is the demo. And it's time for me. I've been naughty because it's been about a week. I have to go to the principal's office. And so now <laughs> let me introduce you to the principal. Here we go, and let's get things sort of moving along here. We have Kyle Harrington, the principal. I'm in the principal's office now. I've been on back because I've been away for a month. <laughs> well, I feel like uh, you, normally we summon people to the principal's office here, but I feel like I've been summoned to get into new diner trace. Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm the one that's in trouble here. This is uh, my, my third appearance, I believe, on, on 
with such a uh, on, on the stream here. I think uh, either an award or some kind of long term punishment, I think, is due. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Jonesy. Well, it, listen, it's, it's it's my pleasure, Kyle. Listen, you, dude, you are literally a living legend here at Dynatrace. You do run the principal's office. And and so, folks, let me explain a little bit that, you know, the, the, the principals here at Dynatrace are uh, members of the sales engineering organization that uh, these are these are folks that, you know, just understand Dynatrace and how Dynatrace works in the real world at a, you know, a, a tremendously mature level. These, the, you know, these people know all of the insides and outs of Dynatrace and the technologies that Dynatrace monitors and how people use Dynatrace. So we are, we, it's just, it's, it's an absolute treat and a pleasure to have someone like Kyle here to walk us through a demonstration of Dynatrace. And as we get set up to do this demonstration, folks, remember, that what's going to happen is you're going to ask us questions as we go through here. So that's the whole purpose of getting to know Dynatrace is that we provide you a moment of audio, uh, audience participation. Feel free to ask questions as we go through. We'll do our best to answer them on the fly as we're going through. So with that, over to you, Kyle. Um, what do you want to show us today? I don't know. I, uh, I've got a few things kind of keyed up here. Um, I think I want to kind of get into um, um, some of the workflow automations that we've been talking a lot about. Uh, I've got a couple things set up, but I think probably the best place to sort of start is probably kind of uh, the, um, pardon me, the OG, right? I think um, if, if you've been, if you've been uh, on any of these streams before, you've probably seen uh, this guy before, the old check destination problem card. I think we all all have seen that one uh, once or twice in our life, but I want to call out over here on the right. Uh, this looks a little bit different. The Dynatrace UI has changed up. I believe, uh, James, you want to chime in again and double down on what uh, what we're calling that now? Is it yeah, Strato? So this is, is that right? The new Strato design system. Absolutely. So... You know, it's interesting if if you're if you're new to Dynatrace, if you're brand new to Dynatrace, then this just you know it it's just going to look the way that it is. Uh, but if you've used Dynatrace for a number of years, then what you're going to see is some new ways that we're visualizing things, and you know the stuff that you've used in the past, the stuff that you've used in the past is still there. It's, you know, often we'll refer to it in the UI as classic functionality. Like there'll be the classic dashboards as, a, as an example. Um, these are, you know, everything that was there in the past is still there today, but now we've just added to it. And this new Stratos design system, it, as, I, as I mentioned, it just, it makes sense because it's all driven by, um, you know, apps that are represented by icons. So it's easy to find things that you're looking for. And you can always flip back and forth. There's little switches within the system that allows me to go move from that classic view to the new view. So what Kyle's doing right now is he's showing us how easy it is to sort of navigate around and look for these apps that are all built on top of, you know, this Dynatrace platform. That's sort of the idea, right? I mean, everything that we work with as, as developers, as engineers, as, you know, SMEs, as even, you know, product owners or applications now, and we're really just trying to get to a place where the UI is a little bit easier to kind of navigate. Um, we've got a couple questions popping in in the chat. I want to address uh, the workflow limitation right off, right off the bat. I believe, Jonesy, correct me if I'm wrong. Let me just, uh, quick disclaimer, I just got back from paternity leave, so I, there's a few things that I may not know. I got to lean... Uh, heavily on the grizzled ancient Mr. Jones here. Um, but I believe that there are some limitations attached to trial tenants for workflow automations. Absolutely. Um, but we uh, I don't believe we have any hard caps, um, uh, certainly not three on, uh, on the automation workflows. And yeah, so. no, exactly. So, so folks, if, you, if you're trying out Dynatrace and you've used the free trial, um, you know, you do have access to all of the functionality, but in some cases, what we tend to do with the trial accounts of Dynatrace is, you know, we may limit the number of workflows that you would create or the number of configurations that you might use. For example, we limit the number of hosts that you can navigate with our free trial. But if you moved into uh, an actual subscription of Dynatrace, a paid subscription of Dynatrace, mm -hmm. yeah, those, those limitations all go away. Oh. 
So jumping back to the Strato concept, right? I think it's it's really cool to kind of highlight sort of how you know the classic Dynatrix isn't going away. I think the fun thing that we've really done here with Strato is not only are we improving every aspect of how the platform functions and how quickly it is to navigate through it, but we're also not changing everything all at once. So the problem card here, right, uh, actually exists again as an app. If I just jump back uh, into here, I can click on the problems, and this will take me live demos. Everyone, we've crashed. Uh, this will take me back to the actual uh, problem app, right? Which looks exactly the same as it always has in Dynatrix, right? So I can still go to my problem card. I can still see the classic, hey, what's going wrong with my application at a glance? Why am I being alerted, right? I've got impacted business applications. I can see that I've got a slowdown in my app. I can drill down into the code level data. I can see that there's a deployment event. Um, and all of this stuff should hopefully be one-on-one for everybody here because everybody is in love and owns all the Dynatrix under the sun, right? Um, but what we really kind of want to dig into, right, is this stuff's great. I love having something that I can look at at a glance and say, what is going on with my app? Why am I having an issue? How do I start to fix it, right? But what Dynatrace is really trying to do now is move further into being an analytics platform. And the first step for me, where I see that really working as somebody who came from the operations world is the ability, and I've gone over to a uh, the different tenant here, I got a few queries that I pre-built in my own environment um, into our app, uh, our notebooks app, right? So again, everything in Dynatrace here is an application. And all that really means is that we're building a front end that to inter integrate with the back end data that we've always had. And we should be able to flip this on in, um, we are G, we are GA, no, Jonesy, you've got to check me, somebody, um, for uh, Gen 3, can we flip his notebooks? Live for existing. It's, it's all of this is live now. Just there should be some fanfare there, John. Is there like mm. like drop confetti? Is yeah. there a ball? Right, <laughs> that was supposed to be like the. I didn't tee that up well enough. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, right, but what what we want to do, right? What, what I really like about notebooks is notebooks kind of gives you this great little workspace, right? So I'm just going to kind of navigate through this really quick. Uh, the idea uh, of, of the Notebooks app is that you can take data, you can parse data, you can save things here. Um, it's literally just a notebook that you can jot down ideas or do explorative analysis on, right? So just uh, real quick, what I've popped in here is we're using the DQL, Dynatrace Query Language, to take a look at all the logs in my environment that have a, an error record, right? So, hey, I can just hit this guy, I get a refresh set of events, and I get timestamp data and all that interesting stuff. But what Notebooks is designed to do is to keep you kind of in the same place so you can continue to look at data and parse it and share it with other people, right? So if I scroll a little bit further down here, um, what we're doing is we're taking DQL and we're really getting rid of uh, the 50 shades of purple, even though I have left this one purple. Uh, I'll go in and I can edit uh, the layer of data that I'm pulling in here, right? So I'm looking at uh, all these error logs, if I could just kind of scroll up for a second here. I'm just looking at the content here, right? And content is helpful, but hey, what do we need when we see something, right? We like to visualize these things. We like to see that big bright red bulb go off and say, hey, look at me, there's a problem. So now I can take this same layer of data and right in the same view, I can start to uh, visualize this, put this up on a dashboard, send this to somebody that is maybe doing a, a review of why that check destination problem or any other application issue is, is taking place, right? Ooh, scary logs. Uh, sorry, I just got to pop. Uh, Jonesy, you got a couple questions in there that I missed. Uh, no, it's, it, keep, keep going, Kyle. We'll, 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 Great. we'll get the, we'll, we'll take a break and uh, final <laughs> questions in as we go. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I think, I think I saw one pop in here is how do we take a look at the severity level, right? Using uh, DQL, I can do that on the fly, right? Very simple, very easy to read. Yeah, it's another language, um, but we're trying to really get to the industry standard where every other query language, every other company has their own query language. We're trying to make ours a little bit more human readable, right? So very simple to read here. I'm going to fetch my logs. I'm going to sort them by a status. I'm going to summarize them by the count of the log error level. So, hey, I've got a couple hundred thousand uh, error events that I can go and review. But what do I really want to know about this? Well, now that I have this information, I can take this log data and I can copy that query again, leave that up there. And now I can start figuring out, well, which one of my hosts is having an issue here? 
So now I can figure that out and find the error issues, and then I can drill that down to an individual host. And of course, Harrington is the noisiest one. He always is. Um, and I can drill down and then start looking at the individual host uh, log errors that are coming from those individual nodes, right? And all of this is in line, right? I'm just scrolling down as I'm thinking of a new thing I want to query. Like, oh, I want this. Oh, I want this. But I don't want to lose you know, the last thing that I looked at. And I can compare them next to each other. The really fun thing that I really like as a, a engineer for a long time was being able to kind of work with things on the fly. So DQL is really good, right? But we also, we don't work with just one tool in notebooks, right? We also support um, JavaScript natively inside the application. So we are gonna talk a little bit about the app engine, which is built, um, which allows us to run applications in Dynatrace. But if I wanna uh, run a function that pulls maybe a, a Lambda call or an external API and marry it with data that I have inside my uh, Dynatrace instance, I can do that right here from a notebook. Uh, very simple JavaScript being run directly in here. Just running a hello world uh, command here, right? Hey, boop, little JavaScript, fires it up. Hey, hello. Uh, now that maybe doesn't look super cool. Is it actually doing anything, Kyle? Uh, I'm a giant nerd, if you don't already know that. Most of you, I hope at least some of you know who I am. I'm a pretty big nerd. I play D&D all the time. I am the perpetual dungeon master. Um, so hey, let's just do a, a quick little look here. I want to do a little bit of math with some data. Um, I want to in, in, uh, instantiate um, an instance where, hey, I just want to get a random number and maybe I'm trying to do an epoch time or something and just uh, build a new hash or an MD5 sub. Here, I'll just take a, a quick math scene with JavaScript, and I will just start rolling uh, character dice. So, hey, my uh, character is rolling a, a d20, and every now and again, oh, there we go. That's what you're looking for. Every now and again, you'll get a one and a critical failure, and now we've fallen down. So now we can begin to see just the building blocks of some of these things that Dynatrace is putting together. But what I think is really cool about, is, uh, about this is how we can start to marry these things. One of the other languages that we support natively in notebooks is Markdown. And what I have always used Markdown, and I think what most other companies use Markdown for, is runbooks, right? So here's a great scenario that I see a lot of our customers are already beginning to adopt, is I've got a set of queries that I want to run, right? I know that when I have an issue, when Dynatrace alerts me that I have a problem, and I need to go investigate it, I have these queries that I'm like, all right, this is how I'm going to go and investigate. So on top of that, not can I only like save that query and place it inside of a notebook, but I can actually have a living document that I can hand off to my triage team, to my on-call, to my developers, and say, hey, uh, these are the steps that you need to run when you see this issue. And you can do them directly from inside the notebook. High-level stuff, really cool. I think it's really sexy. Um, let's try to jump into any of the questions. Uh, Jonesy, anything jumping up? Um, yeah, let's here? get some. So, uh, Sahil is asking, how do we navigate from one tenant to another in the, in the new UI? So, you know, just folks, remember this, this whole UI, if you go down into the left, left hand side of your screen, there's a little person icon, right? If you click on that, you can see here that there's this latest Dynatrace and a little switch. You can just throw that switch and it's going to take you back and forth between the new UI and the classic UI. So if you're in a tenant and you want to go back to the way that it used to look, uh, you can always just switch this back and forth. And in the left nav of the classic tenant, there's that same switch up at the top that allows you to basically switch back and forth. So this it allows you to just sort of navigate back and forth between the two. It's you know pretty straightforward there, folks. So <laughs> if and now if that's the question, if that was the intent of the question about how I go from you know one view and another for a tenant, that's how you're doing that. If the question was related to how do I navigate from tenant one to tenant two, then that's accomplished in pretty much the same way that it's always been accomplished, which is, which is um, you basically can connect tenants together using an environment token. So this is something that you can do programmatically. You can generate an environment token. Once you've got an environment token, you can use it to connect two instances, separate instances of Dynatrace. That allows you to 
pull time series information onto single dashboard. So there's a lot of advantages of being able to do that. In certain cases, in a limited fashion, it allows you to navigate from one tenant to another within the context of a pure path that might cross tenants. So there's a bunch of different scenarios that you could use that for as well. Really dependent on what you meant by uh, how do I navigate from one tenant to another. So if you meant how do I get it from one, you know, from one look and feel to another, or if it was the intent of that was more along the lines of how do I connect two things? I think we answered both of them. We got another question. Let's see if we got any more questions coming up. Here we go. Ah, can we add multiple thresholds onto a single metric? Mm, yeah. we certainly can. We absolutely can. It's really the fun thing about Dynatrace, right? Is that everything that we do uh, can either be done at a macro level. I care about performance of the global application and maybe even a group of applications that make uh, that up. Or I can get down to an individual request layer and get, uh, get granular uh, down into my old UI, um, uh, get down into those individual requests. If I want to go down into that, I'm having an absolute, uh, there we go. Let's just go directly to an individual service, right? And close out of my problem. Um, I'm going to go through the old UI because I feel like a lot of you folks are probably already working through that um, for right now. So let's just say I'm looking at a process group here and I care about um, this group of applications, right? So just quick nomenclature, right? A process group in Dynatrace. Right. I've got a group of Docker containers here that are running across multiple hosts, but they're all the same version, right? It's one application running in multiple places. We put that together as a process group. Uh, if I want to go in and make some modifications to how that works, I can do that in a couple of ways. Uh, uh-oh, are my permissions broken? I did find uh, recently that my local... I don't have them. Jonesy, do you have permissions to view? Uh, as since I've come back from fraternity, I found that some of my uh, access has been revoked in our environment. Well, <laughs> well, you know what? That's actually a good opportunity for us to t- take a moment and talk about permissioning and stuff like that, because that's definitely something that has changed over the past couple of months. So, okay. folks, um, we realize that when enterprise class organizations are utilizing Dynatrace that, and we've, we've heard this over the years, uh, we've seen the requirement for there to be more controls to be placed over configurations, to be placed over, you know, things as, you know, it, you know as, as discrete as those metrics. And what we've done is we've released new functionality In the past, we would talk about management zones as being a way of being able to segment off things. But now we have new concept of ownership. And the ownership can be tied to, uh, in many cases, the RBAC controls that control what you can and can't do inside of Dynatrace. And so there are multiple levels of controls and filtering that allow you to be very specific, say that this person Maybe they can see something, but they can't affect the change of a configuration. Or this person might be able to affect the change of the configuration only for a certain set of entities, but they can't do it for other entities because that's controlled by another team. So that capability, we've rolled that slowly out over the past number of months. And that's what Kyle was basically showing us. Like that was, uh, you know, an example of where, you know, the system basically said, hey, your user profile, you're not allowed to do that. So it's these, as more and more mature organizations come to rely on Dynatrace, um, you know, these types of controls, they're just mandatory. They're part of the process. They have to be there to help control things. So let's, uh, let's see here. The, the you know, get, the, just the, the, to get back to that specific question that we were talking about, and let's just put a, you know, just like sort of uh, finish that thought off. If somebody has a metric, you absolutely can attach to it different thresholds for different types of activity. And, and then based upon effectively what that can then do is that can be tied to a alert profile. So as it can drive different result. So if that threshold, you know, if we've got two different thresholds on the same metric, we could have it do, uh, for example, 
we could have it send a message out to Slack, but then a different threshold is going to control that. Hey, no, now that now it's so bad, we have to generate an ITSM ticket and say something mm -hmm. like now or run a remediation script in Ansible, whatever it might be. So 100%, you can absolutely do that. Uh, is the ownership function different from the management zone? Yes, it is a completely new set of functionality. Management zones are still there. They can still be used, but the new ownership is something that is new and different from the management zones themselves. That is a great question. Thank you. And very timely because we were talking about this. Yeah. Policy, the policy management is actually going to be really, really powerful. Um, I've, I've been using management zones, quick sidebar. I've been with Dynatrace for four years. I bought it as a customer twice. I used it for three years before that. Management zones were the greatest thing since sliced bread to be able to deal with my environments. But um, over over time, I think that we've really found that what the, the customer base really needs is even more granular control. So what we're really doing is kind of shifting towards a more industry standard policy management policy uh, uh, implementation of, of what will be management zones, but in a much, much nicer way where it's not just a drop down on the UI um, and having access or maybe getting a, a brick wall to where maybe you couldn't reach something. But instead saying, hey, when you log in, your entire organization is going to have the ability to say, this is what you get to see. This is what you don't get to see. These are the tools that you get to work with. Um, very simple to work. And uh, I think probably everybody has an AWS because we love IA and AWS, don't we? Nope, for sure, for sure. So that last question, we had a question flash up there for a moment, and that was, will we see a use case for the function of automation? So yeah. do, do we have that set up maybe? I do, I do. I want to bring that. I bring, uh, I got my screen up on this. So the idea here, right, is we've talked a lot about this. And if any of you have seen any of the, the um, webinars that I've done previously, I'm an automation guy. And not because I think I'm smart, but because I'm really, really lazy. I don't want to be bothered with having to do trivial tasks, right? I like to dig into things, but if there's something that I can create that prevents me from having to pick up the phone or press a button, um, that's what I'm going to do. Um, so what we have here with the concept of workflows and Dynatrace is taking Dynatrace data as an event trigger um, and it's setting maybe an SLO or setting a threshold or even just a cron job to say, at this particular time, I want X to happen if I see Y. Um, so I'm gonna jump into just a really simple one that I created because uh, this one I have access to and we can kind of show you some of the bits and bobs. So uh, I've got a fixed time trigger here, but for the sake of argument, let's just say, I wanna just be able to run it for you. Um, but for the sake of argument, let's just say that this is a problem card that gets generated, or maybe it's a weekly report that your CTO wants, right? So what I'm going to do is I will set the hierarchy of this workflow to say, this is the criteria of when I want it to run. And then when it does, I want two things to happen. So every day at 11 o'clock my local time, I want to open up a JIRA ticket, um, and I want to send a notification to my Slack channel that my, my job is running. So let's jump into the Slack integration really quick, right? Um, so the first thing here, and you'll notice that uh, I've always been an operations guy. I'm sending this to my dumpster fire Slack channel because everything is on fire there. Um, and hey, whenever this happens, I want to send this to a specific channel. And I want to know that, hey, there's a problem happening at this time or my Dynatrace job is running. Um, and we'll set a custom uh, job here. Who's, uh, who's on the top of the chat here? We're going to put in Tushar. My message is hello, Tushar. Hope you're having a great day. Uh, so I'll go ahead and I will save that. And so what this will do when I run this, right, is it will basically take a split brain function, excuse me, I'll do a split, a split action, not split brain. When I run something, I'm going to have a series of actions that I can take. Uh, let me just grab this really quick. If I want to add a new task right out of the box, we can just do very simple integrations to run a DQL query, right? So if I want to run a report, get that data out, send it to somebody in Slack. If I want to send it into JIRA, maybe I need to add something into ServiceNow, or I just want to notify somebody again on my team that, hey, your job has finished. I can do that with a few clicks here. I will get rid of this guy. Um, so again, we'll just use uh, Tushar as our example. And at the same time, again, let's just call this uh, an issue. So I will go into my JIRA instance. And what this is doing right now is it's checking all the IAM, making sure that the tokens that I have used are correct, right? And these are all native dropdowns, right? So I'm going to choose a uh, 
drop down for the profiles that I have access to because I built this up uh, in my Jira instance, right? So I have a Dynatrace instance and I have an incident response uh, um, board, which I will use for this example. And there we go. Uh, I'm going to create a task, but you know what? I don't like those to be tasks. This is going to be an issue. So let's add a bug in here. And bugs need to have a pretty high priority. You want to investigate those. Um, it's my job. I care about it. It's going to my, my uh, environment. So I'll set it to myself. And let's say, uh, whoop, just make a little adder in here. Uh, Tushar broke something. Man, why would you do that? That was really rude. Right. So now what I've got is a very simple uh, scenario where I've got a, a issue, a run job, and I will hit run. And we're live down, so we're going to cross our fingers here that everything works. And we're waiting, we're waiting, and we see success. It's wonderful. So let me take a quick jump here, and I will share first my Slack screen. Let me just make sure I have a right one up, because that would be not great. So I've run this a few times, right? But now I'm sitting here and I'm banging away working on my code. And hey, all of a sudden my Dynatrace automated workflow has said, hey, Tushar, just wanted to say hi. By the way, your job finished. Very simple way to start building on top of things, right? So your job's done. Uh, your ticket's been opened. Your, uh, your tacos are ready, right? Um, and at the same, in the same uh, action, Sorry, I'm getting a little bit lost in my own screens. In the same action, right, I can go directly to my, let me just jump over here, changing pages. I can jump into my JIRA instance, and hey, Tushar, you broke something, and now this has been added into my queue here, right? So now I've got a backlog of a ticket that somebody can work with uh, and begin to uh, work on or, uh, you know, investigate. Now we can do additional things on top of this. Uh, the integrations that we have in here, if I go back to my JIRA ticket, let's just say I want to add some additional steps here. So now let me go ahead and add, uh, oops, slow down, right? So now the next step after I've created this, well, I can have my Slack channel talk to my JIRA ticket to maybe comment on that. Or maybe I need to send something out to somebody else who's only using Teams or create an incident ticket, or I can trigger some of the site reliability guardian steps that Dynatrace has set up. And what those are are the real automation workflows, right? Um, before I jump to that, questions here. I think, I, I know I beat up on too sharp. Well, so yeah, no, while here. we're while we're waiting for some more questions to pop up, like this is, you're doing this in a real sort of low no code kind of way like this is just i'm pointing i'm clicking i'm filling in the little fields and whatnot and now i'm actually driving and controlling these workflows this is absolutely amazing so i've i've actually heard now you know this is where people are starting to use these workflows in combination with those site reliability guardians to do things like harden your pipeline, to be able to actually, you know, within your CI CD pipeline, call a Dynatrace workflow that basically evaluates the performance of a build. Is this a good build? If it's a good build, let it through. If it's a bad build, push it back. But now the developer also sees, hey, this build failed, and this is the reason it failed. And Dynatrace is going to obviously, through all of the you know, being able to navigate down into the metrics, into the traces, down into the methods is going to provide you all the details as to why it failed. This is absolutely really right. fabulous. And that's, and that's the magic of it. I, I want to circle back on, on two things. One, it's unbelievably simple. Um, full disclosure, I've been back from paternity leave for three days. All of this changed. I actually wrote all a bunch of JavaScript code to do this natively before we had the integrations. Um, so I had to rebuild this today. I haven't had access or I haven't seen this in four months. Uh, I built both of these integrations to send this data back in through, through 15 minutes uh, because I was able to point and click. I generated two tokens and then I'm done. Um, the other thing is that this was not scripted at all. It's really fun. Uh, but the next thing I was going to show is exactly what James Jones was just talking about, right? Um, Hopefully, again, I'm, I'm just knocking, tooting my own horn as much as I possibly can. Uh, hopefully, some of you guys have seen some of the other stuff I've done around a product that we had uh, called Captain for a long time, right? Which has been kind of cloud automation. Um, but now this is sort of the next step of what we're, we're kind of bringing to the Dynatrace product and bringing to our customer base is putting all of that, those data points and these, these disparate projects that we had into a single place. 
right? So the idea with Captain is that we had a concept called a quality gate. And a quality gate is really just a really fancy uh, way of saying a bunch of SLOs or SLIs that I want to put into a metric and say, if this happens, I want to trigger another event. That should sound really familiar because we were just talking about this with workflows. And oh, look, it is a workflow, right? So using DQL and using these workflows and just kind of, you know, this visual representation of what I want to happen during an event, we can start to see kind of how we can solve problems with, I love the way you put it, Jonesy, low to no code solutions, right? So the first thing that I'm gonna set up here in my job, right, is I've, I can send this to Slack, I can do a bunch of integrations, I can send this to Ansible, right? But what I wanna do here is I've built the concept of Dynatrace called a biz event, which again is just a, a quality gate, right? I'm looking for a series of metrics, I'm putting them into um, a, a value that I care about, and if it crosses that, let me take a look at it. So now I'm using DQL here, right? I'm using a DQL query against these events to look for a very specific cart service, right? Services in Dynatrace, so you know, the applications, the code. I'm looking for a specific stage in my environment. Look at a prod. Is my cart service good in production, right? And hey, the event that I'm looking for specifically is a deployment, right? So I'm looking at deployment events in production for a specific service, right? Very simple, human readable. The next step, right, is once I see, once Dynatrace sees this event, we're going to run a validation against it. And for anybody that's used uh, any kind of SLO gate or quality tool, uh, load runner maybe, right, this should look really familiar, but also very human readable. I am looking for an expression against my cart service for, hey, what's my event? When did it take place? Give me a point in time, let me another point in time, and like compare these two points in time. And the cool thing that we're doing, because all of this data, and we're going to use the we're going to use the fun word Grail, all of this data is being stored in Grail, and we're storing this in a Dynatrace-centric way, is we are looking at this from a SmartScape perspective, right? We're not just looking at a single service, and we're looking at the comparison of it, but we're also traversing. Let me zoom in just a little bit. I'm sure everybody can see this. Right? We are traversing all of the CIs and services that that individual service that we're running that query against actually touches, right? So, hey, we've got some code in here, to, uh, a little bit of JavaScript just to see, hey, up, up and down, what services are these calling? Are there additional um, ownership models that we care about, right? Because I'm not just looking at my one service, right? What we're doing here is I'm making a deployment against my service, but I'm looking for an owner downstream in my next step to say, hey, is there an issue not with just the service that I just that was just deployed, right? But is there an issue somewhere else with another service that is owned by somebody else that isn't being impacted, right? So what we want to do now is get that data. Hey, look at that. We're using Dynatrace again. Just pull a simple entity ID, which service is impacted. We're going to find our database here and our next step. Uh, from the result of that, based on the metadata to find who owns it, Right? So, hey, where is my service? Uh, who, who owns this service? And then we're going to send a message to that person. Hey, we have a, a decision tree here, right? I've gone through a deployment. I've done a validation step. I've identified what things are uh, connected here. I identified who owns it. And now, based on the result that I get, I'm going to let you know, hey, Tushar, your build passed, or hey, Tushar, you might want to take a look at this before you push into production. Or, hey, you got to go look at that Jira ticket that I just opened because now we have an actual failure. This is automation through intelligence, uh, all done with very, very low code here. Uh, I think, Jones, you wanted to jump in there. You know, actually, I sneezed. <laughs> oh, it's so but... exciting that we'll sneeze. <laughs> Hey, it happens. Uh, but, you know, look, uh, Tushar is asking his question. Are these workflows present in the demo environment? That's kind of a leading question, folks. That's a very Dynatrace-centric question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, if any of the folks that are listening are uh, Dynatrace employees, uh, typically, yeah, a lot of this stuff is in our, in our demo environment. But, folks, what we intend is that, remember, with Dynatrace, there is a community, right? And the Dynatrace community has existed for years. And what we fully intend are those workflows are exportable as JSON. So, you know, once you've created a, an interesting workflow, 
uh, what you can do is if, if you want, you could potentially share it with others. So um, we expect that the community will be the place for people to be sharing dashboard ideas, which again are all stored out in JSON. Um, they'll be sharing things like, um, you know, the workflows, they'll be sharing notebook queries, DQL queries. Uh, we expect that, you know, over time that there's going to be just, you know, a, a massive volume of, you know, examples. There's already examples within the documentation, but real world sort of examples of what people have done with uh, this DQL. Let's actually take a pause for a moment to talk about uh, DQL in and of itself, because, um, the, you know, I, I've now that we've, now that we've been doing this for a period of time, we had a preview where we had a lot of customers, uh, you know, have an opportunity to get their hands on this grail data lake house and be able to take advantage of this DQ DQL. Uh, you know, people ask, why did you have to create your own query language? And uh, it's because what happened was we actually started to look at the way that the industry was currently doing things related to logs, for example. And if you're familiar with uh, tooling like Splunk or Elk or, you know, uh, Sumo Logic, there's, you know, there's a pile of tooling that was out there. And we saw and looked at where were people frustrated with the existing state of tooling for, for say, querying data? And, and what we found was, you know, like just case after case after case and example after example of example where, um, you know, people were having to do really unnatural things, for example, with regex. Regex is a perfect example of this. If any of you have ever played with regex or used regex, you know, that actually trying to parse data using regex is is not easy it's 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 tough and you know often it's trial trial and failure like you just sit there and just keep trying to create a pattern that matches the way that you want it to match and then on top of it not only is it hard to build this stuff out it's also computationally really expensive it it's it's tough on the systems that are storing the data to, to parse things that way. DQL, we took the best of both worlds. We figured out, you know, how do you query massive amounts of unstructured data, but be able to do it in a human readable, natural fashion. And that's ultimately what we were able to achieve with DQL. Our experience from our preview customers were the folks that you know, have, you know, the folks that were building queries on top of Splunk or Elk or Sumo Logic and that sort of stuff, they had a look at it and they immediately were able to pick it up and go, yeah, I can use this. Oh, it's that easy. And, and so, you know, from our standpoint, we've had just tremendous feedback, positive feedback from the folks that, you know, really got into this and say this, it just makes sense the way that this language is put together. So we're, we're very enthusiastic about the, uh, you know, the, the positive feedback that we've had. And we're throwing up some links into the chat about where you can find more information about uh, DQL. So uh, here's a question. Is there a way to export log traces from Dynatrace to another storage like Azure Storage? Hmm. That is an interesting question. What do you think, Kyle? Can we export our traces into something like Azure Storage. I'd be curious as to what the use case is for. That would be like, honestly, my first question ran right off the bat is, what are you looking to do? Why do you want to put it into Azure Storage? Is it, is it because, uh, is it a cost thing, right? Is, is it, you know, storing the traces? Is it a, a cost sensitive type of thing? So just from our standpoint, talk a little bit about architecturally how things work with us. Um, you know, the new Grail data lake house that we've built, we do take advantage of a lot of the underlying storage features of the cloud partner that we use. So, for example, for AWS, we use a lot of S3, right? We just use a lot of S3 and it keeps the costs down. So there's no particular reason why somebody for a cost perspective would want to or have to think about moving over to something else. As we start 
moving Grail onto other cloud platforms, it's very likely going to be taking advantage of their store, their native storage mechanisms. So Azure Storage will very likely, don't quote me on this, but very likely be uh, a part of the way that we uh, do things. Um, you know, moving moving forward when when Grail is available on Azure. Same thing for GCP as well. Kyle, do you, like, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah. Like, actually, Fernando actually uh, just gave a gave a follow up on that. If you haven't seen it, right? Uh, the, the real use case there is pricing and archiving long term yeah. data. You know, yeah. uh, absolutely makes sense. You know, I, I've seen. Um, I, I am the perpetual engineer. Um, a lot of people, a lot of organizations that I've kind of worked with are using interesting solutions, uh, things like Cribble, right, to kind of deal with that multiple pipeline data log, sending them to a certain place and needing to store them. Um, I think that kind of solution has a place. Um, but the thing that Dynatrace is really trying to solve here with this is being able to make archiving long-term data um, feasible from a cost perspective, right? So the, the fun part about the Grail storage backend is, as Jonesy's already said, is it's essentially object storage on the backend for us, right? Which allows us to store data in perpetuity. Um, and we're able to do it very, very, very cheaply. So yeah. if you're interested in storing large amounts of data, speak with your sales engineer. That's <laughs> um, <laughs> um, But I, you know, there's there's a lot to be said for also data, data sovereignty, right? A lot of organizations are like, I want to have a clean copy of my data uh, that only I have. Um, and I think that there are solutions out there that can help you do that. And I can say with what I know coming from the lab that that's something that we'll be talking about in the coming months. Stay tuned. Remember, folks, this is a crossover. This is getting to know Dynatrace <laughs> and the principal's office. So, you know, your follow up from this is the next time that there's a principal office uh, webinar, you're going to want to join it. Right? That's right. This is this is like the first Avengers movie, right? Like I'm he's, <laughs> he's Captain. Well, you, I don't know. I guess you're not Captain America. You would be Captain Canada. Is there a version of, of Captain Canada? I'm, I'm the Hulk, though. I'm definitely Captain the Hulk. Brute force. Captain Canada. There you go. I do want to get um, um, Flume's asked a couple times now. I've seen a flow up here. Can Dynatrace check modules in a mobile app to cause why a service is failing? And the answer is 100% yes. Uh, Dynatrace does mobile end to end monitoring. Um, we do we actually have an agent. We can put our own Dynatrace One agent on your mobile device. Uh, we can build it into your actual app. So if you have a user who is hitting a button trying to make something happen on their app and it's crashing, we can tell you why. And if you are actually working with us in your infrastructure, we can only we can not only show you what's happening with the app, but we can tell you what's happening on the back end calls that are taking place from that app and stitch that all together to give you the whole list of view. Um, speak with your sales engineer about that. That's amazing. So, no, it, it's actually, if I could just add to that, just a, a quick little story, because um, it's, it's story time now. Um, and I love story time. So, uh, for for example, we work with a, a lot of banking customers. A lot of banks use Dynatrace, and what we know is, looking at the way that they're using Dynatrace, they use this module that Kyle was just talking about. They've instrumented their native apps because what we've ha what's happened over the past number of years is, you know, I rarely ever sit at my computer and log into my bank but I do it all the time on my phone with my native app. And so these banks now are literally with Dynatrace able to trace and traverse transactions from the moment that I'm actually clicking on make a payment on my phone. They're able to trace that transaction through the web tier, through the application tier, through the middleware messaging tier, through the back end business tier, all the way back to the system of record, which exists within a mainframe. And they can see that all on one screen. It's he said mainframe. He said mainframe. I said, he meant it. And I meant he said it. said what he said. <laughs> so listen, folks, we got five minutes. You know what? I think we might have time for like one last question. Are there any questions that we have kicking around still? Oh, let me scroll. Mm, going once, going twice. All, you know, I think we're good. That's it. No more questions in the queue. Hey, you know what? We're we're near the top of the hour. Um, you know, Kyle, I, I tell you what. How about we use this as an opportunity for for you to actually this is this is your commercial spot. This is your commercial mm -hmm. time. About what what can we expect to see 
from the principal's office moving forward? Yeah, so uh, the principal's office is a little bit more of a, of a technically driven um, practitioner level uh, stream that we're going to be picking back up uh, with my team um, in the coming weeks. Um, so just a quick kind of note on the principals, as Jonesy has kind of already talked about, there is a principal engineer across uh, every sub-region in least North America. There's also uh, in, in Southern America, LATAM, uh, Europe, we're pretty much everywhere. Um, but we're going to have uh, the team that I uh, oversee right now in North America, we're going to have those engineers kind of come in and bring real world use cases um, from the Gen 3 platform around workflows, around the app engine, uh, which we didn't quite get to today. Um, talking about notebooks, talking about Grail uh, and all the other really exciting things that we haven't talked about yet that are coming so very soon um, and really give you folks uh, uh, some hands-on on how to work with that. I'm a big believer in putting together code labs for those things. So expect actual homework and assignments from you. You do not step into the principal's office without coming down without a sheet of paper. Um, so if you want to get your hands uh, dirty, as they say, uh, the, the principal's office is the place for you. We don't put you in trouble, but we do ask that you participate. That's all. Fabulous. All right. Well, hey, listen, Kyle, I've had a fabulous time with you. Folks, as always, what makes getting to know Dynatrace so special are your questions. And so thank you very much for your questions this week. This has just been absolutely fabulous. We'll see you again next time on the next Getting to Know Dynatrace and the next session of the principal's office. So, so long, folks. Have a great day. Yes, hands.